Welcome to the Profile Series. I'm your host, Linda Sandu. Today we have a very special guest, the Governor of Massachusetts. Thank Welcome. You. I'm glad to be here. We are so happy to have you. Thank you. I know you've been doing a tour with Access Television. I have. You like Access Television. I do. I do. Well, for one thing, I stink at sound bites, so it's, <laughs> it's great to be uh, in an outlet and with people who let you can complete a sentence and a thought. Uh, and uh, and people watch it, you know, and, and the they do. Uh, you know it gets replayed. We're trying now to talk about this investment strategy to grow jobs and opportunity, and uh, particularly by investing in transportation and education. And it's complicated, and it asks a lot of people. So this is a great outlet. That's great, and we will talk about that in a minute. Great. I, I promised I'd start out with a few questions. Um, one particularly of my own mm -hmm. that um, you and I touched briefly on, and that's the storms we've I had know. this winter. I know, I know. Well, as we tape, of course, we're in the midst of another one. That's right. And uh, uh, the uh, the biggest concern this time is not so much the amount of snow, um, uh, certainly not on the Cape, right? Um, but the wind damage and the high tides. Right. And uh, the Thursday high tide was pretty high, uh, meaning this morning. Uh -huh. uh, the one we're most concerned about is tomorrow morning, okay. again, uh, according to the forecast. And the trouble, of course, is that uh, much of the coastline is already weakened from uh, from Nemo back in uh, That's back right. in February. So um, obviously the first concern is public safety and that people pay attention to warnings from their local emergency management folks to get out of harm's way mm -hmm. uh, and not wait till the last minute to do it because Absolutely. that means that they not only they are in jeopardy, but the emergency uh, responders are in jeopardy in getting right. them out. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll weather it and, uh, and go from there. Yeah. And we talked uh, briefly about all the damage from Nemo mm -hmm. from past and possibly this one. What does the state think it can do financially for it? Uh, well, we have, uh, we have a pretty good handle on the cost to the state, mm -hmm. uh, meaning at state government level. Right. At this point, we're still trying to gather the local uh, costs and that's uh, something we rely on on the local officials to get for us. Mm -hmm. All of that has to be aggregated and then before you make an application for a disaster declaration uh, or for, for help from FEMA you have to see whether you qualify on these various thresholds. Uh -huh. So that's the reason why all this addition has to happen. Uh -huh. We've asked uh, FEMA for a little more time uh, so that you know to move the deadline a little bit so we can make sure that uh, local communities have uh, the time to get all of the information together and really even to overestimate to make sure that we don't leave anything off the table and then we'll see. But uh, as we were saying before the, the camera went on, <laughs> the sequester is a worry here too. It is. Because uh, one of the things that may get cut is uh, federal disaster assistance. Right, right. And there have been a lot of disasters, I'm right. sorry to say. And let's talk, let's just open up and start talking about that a little mm -hmm. bit. What do you think about that and how is it impacting Massachusetts that that you're aware of and that you think you're talking about we're the sequester generally? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, so the the uh, the biggest impact is not going to be felt through state government. It'll be more direct to businesses and local schools. So mm -hmm. by that I mean, uh, we get a uh, a disproportionate share given our our um, our population right. of grants to universities and research institutions and hospitals. It's a very important part of our economy. Right. Those are all in jeopardy, um, in whole or in part. And mm -hmm. how the feds sort that out, uh, whether they, uh, they just don't do future grants or they um, pull back on exi existing grants, all things we're waiting to see. Um, poor schools, so-called Title I schools, mm -hmm. um, where there is a concentration of kids on the free lunch uh, program, right. which is one of the measures of poverty. Mm -hmm. They get grants directly from the, from the federal government. There are a couple of schools on, on Cape Cod uh, who qualify for, uh, for Title I right. uh, funds. The question there is, do we feel it in this school year uh, or in next school year? But we're going to feel it. And there are things like that that are very, you know, defense industry is actually quite big in, in, the, uh, in the Commonwealth. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll feel it there as well. And do you, will the state have to step in? Are you? How are you budgeting for this? Well, this is the hard part, you see, because the state really isn't in a position to to right. step in. Um, I've proposed in the in the coming budget new revenue for education uh, as well as uh, as well as transportation. And that's really to do some new things, some additional mm -hmm. things. And it may be that uh, that we'll need some of that um, revenue just to plug holes in uh, uh, in schools that have lost uh, some of their federal funding, particularly uh -huh. around. Uh, uh, schools where poverty is concentrated and schools where there are a number of uh, kids with special needs. Right. So again, we don't have enough information to have a, uh, uh, a clear plan. Right. We, we have a bunch of scenarios we've 
we've worked on just so that we are as prepared as possible. But the President, I've got to tell you, is right uh, that there is a better and more sensible way to go about this, a mm -hmm. much more balanced uh, approach, which is a combination of cuts and closing loopholes. Ironically, loopholes that Speaker Boehner supported only a few months ago. That's right. Uh, and, uh, and to do this in a more gradual and, and thoughtful way, but he doesn't seem to be able to get uh, the Republicans on the House side anyway to uh, uh, to engage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's too bad. It that's is too bad. bad for all of us. Yes, absolutely. Um, talk a little bit about what you see with Massachusetts, where you want to talk about uh, some about the transportation and investing. And go ahead and talk about that, because that's big on the, the minds of Cape Cod people. Well, sure. Well, we've had, uh, of course, a, uh, the worst economy through this recession in a generation or that's more. Right. And, uh, we in the Commonwealth are coming out of it faster than most states because um, by making lots and lots of cuts in other areas, um, we have uh, we've been able to invest at least modestly in education, in innovation, and in infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is a winning strategy for us. Absolutely. As of today, I'm very happy to report uh, that the local labor numbers show that we have regained all of the jobs we lost in the recession. Wonderful. Uh, and there are not many other states that can that can say that. Yeah. Now, obviously, still an awful lot of people out of work, uh -huh. and a lot of people worried right. about losing their uh, losing their jobs. And I'm very confident about the future if we do some things. And uh, the two things I think are critical we do are to accelerate uh, and deepen our investment in transportation, to look after what we have and pay the bills we have, and make a handful of expansion, invest in a ha handful of expansion projects that really unlock economic ac activity where it's been locked up uh, before. Uh -huh. And to invest uh, in a few targeted areas in, in education where we know we get a big pickup. Right. Early education, uh, college affordability, mm -hmm. uh, workforce development. And how are you planning on implementing this, or what support do you need? So I have made, uh, you know, I have raised the always uncomfortable question of taxes. Absolutely. And I have proposed to do this by rebalancing the sales and the income tax, by cutting the sales tax, mm -hmm. which is now at six and a quarter percent, down to four and a half percent, the lowest I think it's been forever. Right, um, right. And, uh, and raising the income tax by a percentage point to six and a quarter percent. I also propose that we double the personal exemptions and we eliminate a number of uh, deductions and exemptions. The net effect is this. For about half ta of the taxpayers, the total taxes they pay would either stay the same or go down. Uh -huh. Or go down. And for those making over about $65,000, they would go up according to their ability to pay. So if you make, say, $100,000, your total taxes would go up a couple hundred bucks. Okay. That's not nothing. Right. Um, that's, uh, you know, for a lot of people, that's that's real money. Right. Uh, Absolutely. I, I get that. But it is, it, it does get us a little bit more progressivity in our total uh -huh. taxes so that if you're if you're struggling, if you're working class, um, you get a little relief. If you're more fortunate, you contribute a little more. Uh -huh. And altogether, this raises about $1.9 billion, which we would divide about evenly in transportation and in uh, and in education. That's wonderful. And will there have to be a vote on this? Oh or? yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. It's a. It's a. You know. There's a big <laughs> you debate. Can't just no. 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 It's. A, I mean. It's not. <laughs> it's still a democracy. It's still a democracy. And it's a. Look. This isn't easy, right? I mean, right. people. There is a broad consensus yeah. that these are the right investments to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will just say for people who are interested to to know exactly what investments we're talking about in your own community. Right. Um, just let me plug the website, mass.gov slash governor, and there are maps that show exactly what's happening oh, in your great. neighborhood, uh, what great. we're proposing to do in your neighborhood, both on the transportation and the education uh, side. Uh -huh. um, so people like the, the, the what and the why. They even get the why, which is about creating jobs and opportunity. Uh -huh. It's the how that gives everybody right. heartburn. I right? know. Um, can't we have this without, uh, without paying more for mm -hmm. it, or can't we do additional reforms in order to find that 1.9 billion. Right. I can tell you that after um, after uh, uh, cutting headcount by 6,000 positions in the last couple of years and consolidating agencies and shutting down the Turnpike Authority and rebalance, you know, we're asking employees to pay more of their health care costs. We've cut out all the games and the loopholes and the pension program. Mm -hmm. That reform is important and it's been, it has enabled us to make the investments that we have made, uh -huh. but to move to a 21st century transportation and education system, it is going to require new revenue, and we have to have an adult conversation about that. Absolutely. Now, you have two years left. Do you see this happening soon? I think so. I mean, the, the, meaning the debate will come to a close. Uh -huh. 
And you know, I haven't. There isn't anything that's come back from the legislature exactly as I proposed <laughs> it. So it. I, I totally get that this is. Uh, this is a back and forth, and it ought to be a back and forth, not just with me and the legislature, but with the general public. Sure. People should, in, should engage. Yeah. Um, they, should, they should go on the website. They should look at the, the maps. They should tell us whether the projects that we have identified with the help of local folks are the right projects. Uh -huh. um, they, ought to, uh, they can go on the website and see exactly what the uh, impact would be on their own household budgets mm -hmm. of, of, this, of these tax changes I'm, I'm talking about. Most people like the cut in the sales tax and are a little more squeamish about the uh, 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 increase, increase in the income tax. I totally, sure. I totally get that. Right. So, but it's this is a part of a budget I have uh, proposed, and the legislature has to resolve the budget by the by the beginning of the next fiscal year, which is July one. So okay. we're going to be intense in this for the next few months. Well, so that's good. Yeah. That's good. And do you have anything on the Cape that comes to mind of what that will be part of this? New there are a bunch of uh, transportation projects. I mean, the, there's the there's the train to Hyannis, for That's example, right. which we're going to uh, start to pilot this summer. Everybody's excited and about the, that. And we're really excited yeah. about it. And, uh, and if the projections hold up and we get the revenue that we're hoping uh, from, uh, from these investments, this will be a year-round train. Mm -hmm. that um, would be there are a whole host of uh, road widenings and uh, bridge refurbishments that, uh, that get done. You know, there are 40,000 kids on the wait list for early education programs in the Commonwealth. Oh, I didn't and, know. Uh, and thousands of them live on the, on the Cape. Mm -hmm. And uh, their readiness for, uh, for full-time school, when it, when it, you know, for big kid school sure. when the time comes, um, uh, helps determine their academic success through life. So right. uh, it's a quintessential long-term kind of investment. It's, it's about what happens not in the next couple years while I'm in office, but what happens in the next generation. Right. Well, let's talk a just briefly because a lot of our questions were people wanting to know what are you going to do when your two years are up? <laughs> i got to find a job. Everybody wants to I know. i got to find a job. I mean, I <laughs> promised Diane that uh, my wife that uh, when I was done with these two years, I go back into the private sector, uh, which is where I've spent most of my life uh -huh. um, and which I miss on payday. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> so, of course. Of course. So, uh, I, and I hope that there will come a time. I mean, I, I'm, I don't, I didn't run for governor because I wanted a career in uh, in public life. Mm -hmm. I ran because um, of what's going on out here. You know, right, the, the, right. just that uh, this back to this point about about the next generation. We have lost in America. I think that sense that we need to be governing not just for the next election cycle or news cycle, correct, but for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And I saw that by the way, that same kind of behavior in business where where people were managing for the next mm -hmm. quarter. We need to start looking out again. Right. Right. Um, you know, the reason we take Route Six for granted is because our grandparents didn't. Right. Right. Yeah. They said we need to sacrifice because this is good for us and our kids. That's right. And grandkids. So. Um, uh, and so I, th I felt that was missing at the time when I ran for, uh, for governor, and I, and I have tried my level best to govern that way with that right. sense of generational responsibility. So I, I ran because I thought there was something I could contribute in that moment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm, as I say, I'm looking forward to getting back into private life, and, and if there's another opportunity to do something else where I think I have something to contribute that somebody isn't contributing, then maybe then. On the national level, maybe I don't know. I really, I'm, I'm not being cute. I really yeah. don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have a plan. I'm lots of people, you know, whispering in this <laughs> ear or that ear, do this. Or everybody do wants that. you. Well, I don't know about everybody. <laughs> well, here's some of the questions that that people have concerns about, and one is from a, a very good friend of mine, Paula, who wants to know about the Affordable um, Care Act. Mm -hmm. Does that trump the Massachusetts Health? So there are some parts of this where we, first of all, I'm really excited about the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. because, uh, for one thing, it's, it's modeled on what we've done here right, in Massachusetts. Right. And, uh, and I think just as we have shown the nation a model for universal care, we're going to be the folks who crack the code on cost containment. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're further along than the nation as a, as a whole. So to the extent that um, the ACA is not as far along, we're trying to work out those, uh, you know, smooth out those differences. So that right. the, there's not an easy answer to Paula's question, mm -hmm. um, but uh, things like trying to preserve the co-ops that small businesses can now join, so they aggregate and get the buying power Huge. of big businesses. Is a yeah. great thing we That's did here. That's so great. And uh, it's really important to me that we preserve uh, that and things like it. Mm -hmm. What about Cape Wind? 
What about it? <laughs> <laughs> you are a supporter of I that, and I know that from, from talking to you in the past. Yeah. Um, talk about why you are supportive mm -hmm. of it, because I think that's important for people to know. Now, well, let's not get into a debate. But yeah, no, it's a, it's a, look, it's a, it's a, uh, um, you know, there, there are thoughtful views on both sides of that question Correct. on the Cape and elsewhere. Uh -huh. um, I support it because, um, you know, we, we, after you uh, uh, control for and um, and and design around the. Uh, Issues of uh, of the impact on aeronautics and birds and uh, fishing and uh, and the rest of it, um, and I think that the that the developer has done that, mm -hmm. uh, and all the approvals and so forth. Um, we need this. We need to really focus on how important it is we get serious about clean and alternative energy. Absolutely. Um, you know, you can you can argue, and people have over the scale and scope of this project, um, but. Uh, uh, I love the idea that Massachusetts would be home to the first uh, offshore wind farm. And I do believe that in the clean and alternative energy space, if we get this right, the whole world will be our customers. So yeah. good for the environment, but also good for, um, uh, for the economy. Mm. In clean and alternative energy generally in the sector uh, here in the Commonwealth, of which wind is just a part, um, we've had a, uh, I think a 6.7% increase in jobs the year before last and an 11 percent increase in jobs last mm -hmm. year so it's it's happening economically right. we are number one in the nation in energy efficiency um, for two years running now um, that was a uh, that was a distinction held by California for decades mm -hmm. uh, we've beat we beat them out uh, we've had a I think a 40 fold increase in solar uh, generation right. and a 30 fold increase in in wind generation, come wealth wide, uh -huh. uh, I mean. And that's not to say that every project is right everywhere. Uh -huh. That's not what I'm saying. I never have. Um, but uh, where projects are right, then I think uh, we, should, we should support them. And I, I think Cape Wind is, is right. There you go. And then another question came up about Cape Cod. Yeah. You love Cape Cod. What's not to love? They want to know what you love about it. So the first time <laughs> I was exposed to Cape Cod, I was a freshman, a, a scared freshman from the south side of Chicago at Milton Academy. Mm -hmm. It was 1970, I was 14 years old. And the long weekend came, so I've been, you know, I saw the campus for the first time the night before classes began. Mm -hmm. I think you know this story. Yeah. And, uh, um, and the long weekend came, uh, the Columbus Day weekend, and all the kids were going off to their you know, mountain houses and lake houses <laughs> and what have you, and doing their thing. Because um, uh, it was just a different world for me. Mm -hmm. And there was this great old Yankee teacher whom I adored, um, English teacher of mine who lived in Milton, had a house in South Orleans. And he invited me, his, his, uh, his wife was a, was a Spanish teacher. Um, and they had two children, not quite my age, a little younger. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to come and spend the weekend with him. And I was so nervous. I mean, you know, already t I already have a case of nerves about being out of place sure. anyhow. And just ratcheted up because this uh, legendary teacher was inviting this new kid mm -hmm. to come spend the weekend with his, uh, with his family. And we drove down that Friday afternoon. Uh, he had the game he played with his kids about the first one to see the, um, uh, the Sagamore Bridge, I think it was. Maybe it was the Bourne Bridge. And... Um, we got down to South Orleans. His wife had gone down earlier. The house was on the water, um, or you know, had a, um, just, but the property went down to the uh, down to the water. Uh -huh. I'd never seen anything so so beautiful, and uh -huh. I think it had to do as much with the graciousness and Absolutely. warmth of this family as it did with the physical beauty of the place. Uh -huh. And I have always had that connection to the Cape on a on a on account of it, it was a a magical time. Yeah, that's such a great story. Yeah. That's such a great story. Let's go to the next question. Um, what gun control? Yeah. With with what's happened in Connecticut? Mm. How, wh what's your feeling? What's your Well, so not necessarily about what happened in Connecticut. Uh, obviously horrible what happened horrible. In, in in Connecticut and I think uh, I I don't I don't I haven't met anybody who thinks otherwise. Oh, um, yeah. It's just, you know, I spend a lot of time in classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, you do. Because it's, it's important to me. I, you know, you want to get your own feel for what's working and not working in, in classrooms. And I sit with some of those little kids, and I think to myself, it's just hard to imagine that somebody would point a 
gun at, at, yeah. at a face like that and pull the trigger. Um, legislatures so often in the Congress uh, legislate in crisis. Um, and if anything, I hope this crisis uh, brings our Congress back to their senses in terms of uh, uh, assault weapons. Mm -hmm. We have a pretty good assault weapons ban here in, in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I actually think it was signed by Governor Romney, and, mm -hmm. and uh, kudos to him. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very hard to do um, uh, sensible gun control state by state mm -hmm. because our borders are wide open. That's and, right. And uh, if you can, if you can get a an assault weapon somewhere else and put in, put it in your trunk, um, unlikely you're going to be stopped on your way back home to uh, uh, to Massachusetts. That's right. So there are loopholes like that. that we we have, uh, you know, you can check someone's background and must check check someone's background if they buy a gun at a gun shop, mm -hmm. but not at a gun show. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that's so. That ought to be um, fixed. Um, I have proposed for the last several years uh, that we do, uh, that we join the national uh, mental health background uh, system. Mm -hmm. um, that has not moved through our legislature in the past. I hope it will uh, now because, again, that's relevant information about, uh, about gun safety. Absolutely. And I think we can have sensible gun control consistent with people's interest and right to uh, have a weapon for sport or, mm -hmm. or even for self-protection for that mm -hmm. matter. On the national level, people want to know how, what involvement do you have, not with gun control, but with anything. What is your passions on the national level, and and what sort of statement is Massachusetts making? Well, we are. Uh, first of all, I think uh, I th I think job growth really is the president's uh, number one agenda. Yeah. And so when I when I hear the president talk about that formula of education, innovation, and infrastructure, uh, as he has in a couple of State of the Union uh, addresses. Uh, or about uh, uh, particularly transportation and early education, which he did this last time. That's Sometimes right. it feels a little spooky because uh, um, it sounds so like what we're talking he's, about and working on, on here. Well, not, no, no, it's <laughs> not copying, but it, it has been a great thing to have an agenda here in the Commonwealth so aligned right. with uh, President Obama's mm -hmm. agenda. Um, our delegation has been superb absolutely superb to a person mm -hmm. uh, in uh, uh, in helping us advance that agenda here and having uh, and making the most of that uh, partnership which is great I am really excited about the prospect of comprehensive immigration reform mm -hmm. which I think can be done and must be done in a way that's consistent with American values mm -hmm. uh, and is a balance of uh, border control but also a path to citizenship for right. People who you know you want to bring people out of the shadows and into the Absolutely. into mainstream economic and, and social life, and I think there's a way to do that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, uh, that's fair. So um, I uh, I will tell you that um, the president, uh, who's been a friend for a long time before he was uh, the president, whom I admire tremendously. I just I I just don't know how he keeps the patience he does with the Congress. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've come to understand with our legislature that, um, as I said earlier, I'm not going to get what I asked for um, the first time I ask or um, or in the form I asked for it. But on the whole, they have given me the tools I've asked for, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, and I have come to respect and un well, first of all, to understand uh -huh. and to respect their processes. Mm -hmm. But when I see what's happening in the Congress and that people will make decisions sometimes not to do what is in the national best interest right. if they think it reflects well on the on the president it is extraordinarily uh, disheartening to me and it, and I, it's amazing to me that the president keeps the patience and equanimity he does right and that the voters don't see that and, I think and the voters want do to make a change I think the voters do see that um, I think they they sent the Congress a message in re-electing this president mm -hmm. And I think, um, and you know, I don't mean to sound like a pundit, and I don't know, but I suspect from having been out around the country a lot um, uh, in the course of the president's campaign that their patience is running out and that there are going to be some changes in the midterm elections if the Congress doesn't shape up and act as a partner. Right, right. What, what's one of your biggest concerns about the state of Massachusetts? I'm always concerned that we're not growing fast enough. Um, more and more I'm convinced that um, that pace of growth is within our collective control mm -hmm. and has a whole lot to do in the government side with uh, what kinds of investments we, we make and where, which is why 
the budget I proposed is as bold as, as it is. Mm -hmm. I am very, very keen that we unlock economic opportunity in parts of the Commonwealth where it has been locked up. Mm -hmm. That is mostly up to the private sector, but transportation and education is key to that. So um, just take transportation, for example. One of the reasons why we have starved infrastructure on the Cape in central and western Massachusetts, mm -hmm. up in the North Shores, because we poured all our resources into the big dig mm -hmm. in downtown Boston. I love the project. I'm a frustrated architect, so <laughs> I, I kind of like the the whole intricacy uh, of it. I liked it better, you know, at five or six billion dollars than twenty-two billion dollars. Right. But um, because we um, paid for that the way we did, by piling all the debt onto the T, and uh, we basically starved, and on the old, onto the old Turnpike Authority, we starved investment everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And that shows. Right. Um, so when I talk about South Coast Rail, for example, um, down to New Bedford and, uh, and Fall River, or the rail line down to um, Hyannis uh, that starts this summer, uh, or, uh, uh, or some of the road uh, and RTA investments in central and western Massachusetts, those aren't wish lists. Mm -hmm. That's about making uh, transportation real mm -hmm. and economic opportunity real in parts in the rest of the Commonwealth. And we need that kind of uh, uh, Commonwealth-wide equity, I think. Um, and I do worry because we have a very sort of Boston-centric state government in many in many ways Absolutely. I think for for uh, for a long time we tried to we've tried to uh, uh, change that uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, in this term but you can see how easy it drifts in that uh, in that direction I just think we all need to be very very intentional mm -hmm. uh, about not letting that happen mm -hmm. Well, Governor, I can't thank you enough for being here today. Thank you for having me. And I um, had the pleasure of meeting your press secretary, Bonnie, who's who's a lovely woman. Isn't she great? And I kind of ran She's some giggling of, over there I now. I know, somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> and, and I ran some of the questions by her, and she said, oh, you can ask him anything because he's been asked everything. <laughs> and so I asked her from Debbie, who, of all the important questions, Debbie wants to know what cologne you wear. Oh, wow. <laughs> Bonnie said you've never oh, been asked that. I know. I don't think I've ever. I'm not even sure. I know. I wear a. Um, I wear an aftershave af I, that I put on after I shave every day. I guess that's why they call it aftershave. That's right. That my wife first gave me, I think, 25 years ago. It's hard to get around here, but it's by Chanel of all. Ooh. So, there you are. There you go. That's Thank it. you so much it's for joining us. It's a pleasure. Great to be with you. I'm Linda Sandu. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.